this time on Fat Squad. My project is about white nose syndrome, and it's really deadly. About like 600,000 to 900,000 bats die per year from wind farms. Echolocation is how bats see with their ears. This is just amazing. Hey bat friends, I'm Cami, and I'm your Bat Squad host. Bats are really cool. They have the cutest little faces and they come in lots of different colors. I mean, some bats look like dogs and some, well, they just look a little strange. The sad thing is though, that bats are facing a lot of problems, like getting sick. Calvin, can you please tell us more about your science fair project on a disease that's affecting bats all across America? Hi, I'm Calvin, and I'm from Texas, and I'm 10 years old. My favorite bat is the Mexican free tail. Um, I did a lot of my research on it, and I learned a lot about it. My project is about white nose syndrome. White nose syndrome is caused by a fungus and it's really deadly. It's killed millions of bats. And what it does is um, it destroys the skin on the bat's wings and so they can't really fly well and they um, and it wakes them up in the winter time and, and it um, kills the bats because they starve to death. It likes cold temperatures, so it likes cold bats. Um, on the inside, the bats are really warm, so they stay warm. But on the outside, the bats are really cold, and the fungus grows on it and turns into the disease. The rest of the bats that hibernate and get white nose syndrome are, um, are dying very quickly. In the winter, it snows a lot, so if there are no mosquitoes and bugs, the bats can't eat and then they eventually die of starvation. And how I heard about it was um, my local wildlife refuge center brought some bats and they talked about white nose syndrome. And I went to Carlsbad and they talked about white nose syndrome. So I thought it was a pretty big deal so I started looking it up and I found all sorts of information about it. White nose syndrome started in Aubilly, New York, and it spread on the entire east coast of the United States. Um, Michigan, Virginia, Washington, D.C., all those big places. In my research of white nose syndrome spreading, um, there I only did one way because um, bat to bat seems more effective, but there's actually three ways that it can spread. Um, one is bat to bat, um, the other one is person to cave to bat, and the other one is bat to person to another cave. Um, but recently, um, Washington State has had um, white nose syndrome there, and what I think it was was a person um, that doesn't know what he's doing, or someone that just didn't clean their equipment right and they went up into Washington State and had white nose syndrome somewhere on their body and they spread it there. Thanks Calvin. That's really sad that the disease has spread. That's why it's really important that we don't enter caves where bats hang out. They may be cool, but it's very dangerous. We don't want to get the fungus on our clothes and spread it too. So Calvin, what did you look out for your science fair project? What I did um, for Science Fair was I did white nose syndrome as my research. I wanted to see if the other bats could get white nose syndrome to the Mexican free tails. Here in Austin, on um, Congress Avenue Bridge, it's the largest urban colony in the world. And in Bracken Cave, it's the largest colony in the world. And um, it'd be pretty devastating if we lost um, those two colonies. And so I started researching about the two colonies, saw that they're really big, and then I started looking around Texas, um, seeing if there are any 
places that have caves and the bats are have white nose syndrome. So I found Franklin County in Arkansas. And so I started looking at the summer habitat ranges, seeing if they would intersect. And I found out they didn't. They're about 555 kilometers apart. And so we're safe for now with the bats. I studied Mexican free tail bats, so it was really cool to see my study that close. Um, I never knew they looked like that. They call them Mexican free tails because of their um, free tail. Um, in bats, um, they, they have a tail, and there's a membrane that holds the tail in place so that they can turn easier. But um, Mexican free tails, they have a um, little bit of membrane, but the rest is tail. They look much like dogs, and um, they they act um, really close to dogs, and, um, and they're really cute. That's a really interesting project, Calvin. Those bats were so cute. White nose syndrome is a real problem, but I'm glad that scientists and adults and other people are working hard to help our bats. So Cameron, can you tell us about another problem that bats might face? Hi, I'm Cameron pettinger Willy. I'm 14 and I'm from Oregon. So wind farms are very important for our environment now because they're renewable energy and it's easy for our environment to use that and it's not bad for it. Um, but the problem is that it's also affecting bats and other creatures around because a lot of bats are dying from it. Turbines can be a great danger to bats because even though it looks like it's moving really slowly, the blades are actually moving very quickly and the bats can run into that and may not be able to detect how fast it's moving and that can hurt them and cause a danger to them. So one way how people are deterring bats from wind turbines is the idea of making a sound that bats fly away from and it's eco-friendly because other people like humans may not be able to hear the sound and, but it just keeps the bats away naturally. So my science fair project is about a, a question of where to place a sound making device on a wind turbine to repel bats. And I first got interested in this project because my mom works at a wind turbine company and I was learning about how all the bats were dying from the wind turbines. About like 600,000 to 900,000 bats die per year from wind farms and I was really worried about that because I know of all the major bat species and it's important to protect them. Especially because wind energy is getting really important in our world today and we need to protect the other animals too, like bats. I met with Chris Hine, an expert that works at Bat Conservation International, and he talked to me about how a sound can repel bats by showing me a video where bats were flying by a cave and they emitted a certain sound, and the bats were, went away from that sound. And that got me thinking about the ideas that they're researching right now, about how they could place a sound making device on a turbine to repel bats from the area. And I was wondering about if you placed it on the center of a turbine, which is called the nacelle, would it be, work just as well as going on the outside of the blades and how the sound would be distributed? And so I went about testing that, placing it whether on the tips of the blades or in the center. And then I found different results because I measured with a decibel measure meter and then an Anabat device, which is measuring frequency of sounds. And I found that placing it on the tips of the blades of the turbine distributed the sound equally around the fan or the turbine as it would be on, but then placing it on the center, it was louder just coming from the center going straight forwards. And so there would be different results of whether or not you wanted the bat, if it was flying in from the side, would it hear it just as well if it was flying in from the front. So in the science fair, I got first place overall for the science fair at districts. And then at the state science fair, I got first place in my category. And then I applied to go to the National Science Fair in Washington, D.C., and I got elected as a semi-finalist for that. That's so cool that we may be able to use sound to save bats. You got to use some really interesting equipment in your project, too. Scientists use a lot of interesting equipment to answer research questions. Maybe Alexis can tell us more about what it's like to do bat research. Hi everyone, my name is Alexis. I'm 14 and I live in Tennessee. I've been working with bats for seven summers now. 
I first got excited about bats when I was in third grade, and all of my projects have dealt with white-nose syndrome and the effects of the population, just in different ways. Some I went netting and some I used the detector uh, detecting echolocation. My favorite part of my research is actually going out into the field and either looking at the detector and seeing how much it jumped from seven days ago to now and going out netting bats. I really love doing that. My most recent projects have been dealing with the acoustics or bat echolocations and the activity calls. Echolocation is how bats see with their ears. Not necessarily bats are blind, but they don't really use their eyesight in the darkness. What it is is a high frequency noise that we cannot hear. They use it to detect the size, shape, and texture of a tree or a moth to see if it's moving or it's standing still. They also detect if there's an object that is stationary or not moving, so they don't run into it when they're flying. When they do detect something that's moving, they go for it and try to eat it. A uh, bat detector is a way we can detect bat activity calls. We cannot hear bat frequencies because it is above our range of hearing. A bat detector tells you the species of bats and generally how many bats there are in the area. So this bat detector is a handheld device used when you walk around at night and you want to get those bat activity calls in your area where you're walking. The one on the tree I have is one that you can have for weeks so you don't have to go around walking at night. It is up for months at a time, but I check on it every seven to 10 days. It does not give you instant feedback. It records it in a chip, and then you plug it into your computer and see how many bat chats you have. I decided to put my bat detector on a low-hanging branch and a sturdy tree. The low-hanging branch is for the microphone, so I can wrap it around and I can reach the box if I need to. I like to put bat detectors next to the river because that's where bugs usually are, and bats go to bugs. In the data I've collected, I've noticed that there has been a decrease in bat populations of the Great Smoky Mountains. Like when I first went out, all you could catch were northern long ears, and some odd years later, you can't find any anymore. And that's due to whiteness syndrome. The loss of bats mean more insects, the more insects mean the loss or damage of crops and that is less food for us. I've shared my results of my research using science fair projects, classroom talks, going to rotary clubs, food at the zoo, and bat walks. I have been competing in science fairs since third grade. I've competed in schools, counties, and regional science fairs. This is my project I did in third grade. It's called Save Our Bats, and I just did a gist about white-nose syndrome and how bad it affects our bat populations. This is my seventh grade project, Bat Chat, using echolocation to determine white-nose syndrome effects. I used echolocation using a song meter SM2 Plus to detect if there is a decrease in the common cave-dwelling bats of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This year is my seventh summer. My project is called Pseudo Gymno Ascus Destruct Hands using white nose syndrome to compare Lassieris borealis to the general myota species in Twin Creeks versus Soak Ash Creek, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park ecosystems. If other kids would like to do this type of research, you can go out with a scientist, but you always have to have an adult, and of course you can do this type of research. so cool to hear about all the science research that Calvin, Cameron, and Alexis are doing. Who knows what amazing discoveries they'll make as they continue their research. Even though bats face many threats, we can still do a lot of things to help protect them.
And if you're really interested in saving the bats, then you might want to tell a friend or family member. They might be interested and want to help too. You can learn more about Wynose Syndrome by completing the activity, There's a Fungus Among Us. Mm -hmm. Fungus Among Us. Join our next webcast, Bat Chat, where you can learn even more about bats and how to join the squad. See you then. Bye.